Hi, I'm very excited to give an invited talk here at ICAPS, and many thanks to the organizers for pulling off this virtual conference. I know it's a lot of work. So before I get started, I would like to mention that my slides are available at www.automl.org slash talks. And all the references throughout are hyperlinks that you can click to actually get the PDF. So you can download the slides, follow along as you listen to the talk, and when you want to get more details on a slide, then there's typically a reference where you can directly get the paper. So this talk is all about getting the most out of your planners. And um, what that means can be summarized in this one slide here. So algorithm configuration, which we'll be talking a lot about today, finds good settings of your parameters. This is of course useful because nobody really enjoys optimizing their hyperparameters by hand. Um, in particular, not, for example, on a per-domain basis. But algorithm configuration is still very limited. It only finds a single fixed parameter setting. And it can't adapt, for example, to the instance at hand or to the search progress and so on. And in this talk, what I want to do is propose dynamic algorithm configuration, duck, which basically can take some state features. And then while well, you have this agent, um, Mr. Duck, and that chooses the right parameter setting for these state features at hand. And those state features could include information about the instance that you're solving, the search progress, the time, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there'll be two parts to the talk. The first one is, well, actually an overview about previous work on meta-algorithmic approaches, namely algorithm configuration, and also some about algorithm portfolios. And then the second part is about dynamic algorithm configuration, which actually we'll see generalizes both algorithm configuration and portfolios. This work is based on um, papers with several people. In particular, the first part is um, goes back to work that I've done in my PhD with Holger Hose and Kevin Layton Brown at UBC. And the second part is on dynamic algorithm configuration. That's work um, mostly done in Freiburg and our extended group there. So it's mostly um, done with my PhD student, Andre Biedenkap, and my previous postdoc, Marius Lindauer, who is now a professor at the University of Hannover in Germany. And the planning part here is also um, um, chiefly includes David Speck, who is the first author of a paper on duck for planning that I'll be talking about, and Robert Mattmüller, both from the AI planning group in Freiburg. The extended team of people working on DUCK in my group includes my postdocs, Noor Avad and Steven Adriansen, and my student, Greza Schala, and my previous master student, and now Marius's PhD student, Theresa Eimer. So let's get started with algorithm configuration. The algorithm configuration problem is as follows. So we are given an algorithm that has a configuration space, and we have some training instances, and then we ask a configurator to find the best parameter setting of this algorithm on these training instances. And then it spits out this optimized configuration. And then at test time for new instances in an online application, it's just used directly. The algorithm is used with this one optimized configuration. So a bit more formally, well, we have this parameterized algorithm, the configuration space we're going to denote with theta. We have a distribution of our problem instances, these training instances, with domain i. And we have a cost metric that assesses the cost of a configuration in theta run on an instance in i. And what we are looking for is a theta that uh, minimizes this cost metric in expectation over instances sampled from this distribution d. So that's the algorithm configuration problem. Um, now, how do we apply this to planning? What can actually be parameters in planning? Well, some examples are well, which heuristics do you choose? Um, Subparameters of each of the heuristics are there. There's lots of parameters. Um, and how do you combine the heuristics? That, that's a very important choice. Then there's some parameters in the search strategy, whether you actually use a global search or a local search, whether and how much randomization you use, and how to combine these various search strategies. And as we'll see, you can even optimize things such as the domain model encoding and the problem model encoding. More generally, um, when you think about what could be a parameter, it's really any design decision for which you have more than one alternative. 
and parameter types that are typical in algorithm configuration are Boolean, categorical, integer, and continuous parameters. And there's also this concept of conditional parameters that are only active dependent on the setting of some other parameters. So in this case here, the subparameters of a heuristic H are only active if that heuristic H is actually active. So if um, the Boolean parameter um, deciding whether this heuristic is on or off is on. And that actually gives rise to a structured space with sometimes multiple levels of hierarchies um, that, well, can also be pretty high dimensional. For example, in this case of LPG, we have something like 62 parameters giving rise to more than 10 to the 17 different configurations. And that is a reason that we actually call this algorithm configuration rather than just parameter tuning. So algorithm configuration is a really useful abstraction. Um, it has improved algorithms across many different areas of AI, such as in um, satisfiability solving, mixed integer pro um, programming, the most probable explanation problem, timetabling, and most important to you, of course, AI planning. And in particular, in AI planning, um, I'm listing four different applications here of um, configuring fast downward, LPG, and then also the domain model and the problem model. And for each of these, I will actually have a slide later on to give, give you some more details. Um, before that, however, I'd also like to mention that algorithm configuration is also a key enabling technology in automated machine learning, um, AutoML, for example, enabling tools such as AutoWeka, AutoSkillLearn, and AutoPyTorch. And AutoML is actually where I spend most of my time these days, so it's really refreshing to be talking to the planning community for a change. All right, um, algorithm configuration is a useful abstraction that is also reflected in it being increasingly popular and increasingly used. And um, so here's, for example, the citation numbers for the four most popular algorithm configuration tools, and we see a nice increase over time. Um, there is um, various different algorithm configuration tools. So iterated f rays is um, based on sampling. So it's an um, estimation of distribution approach. GGA and GGA++ are genetic algorithms. ParamLS is a local search algorithm. And SMAC is based on Bayesian optimization. And if you'd like to use um, several of these different um, packages, then um, I would recommend doing so through the ACLib interface, which implements all of them. And um, my own empirical evaluation of methods in ACLib shows that um, SMAC is actually very competitive, and that's why I'll mostly be talking about SMAC today, um, also in the interest of time. Um, for you in AI planning, it might be um, most interesting to, to look at these rows, where, for example, while well, this was a default performance of, of an algorithm, um, LPG and SMAC found a uh, a much lower, in this case, runtime um, than ParamLS did. And so if you've used ParamLS before, um, I would encourage you to also have a look at SMAC. Um, typically, it's giving me better results. So what is SMAC? Um, at a high level overview, um, SMAC works as follows. So it runs um, some um, runs of different configurations on different instances, and then um, at each step, learns a model from this performance data that maps from a set of um, a, a combination of a pair of um, a configuration and an instance to the predicted runtime. And then it uses this model to select promising configurations. It compares these um, promising com configurations against the best configurations so far by executing new algorithm runs and then iterates. So after it has executed these new algorithm runs, it updates its model and continues. And the initialization is done by executing some runs and collecting the performance data. So that's a high level. And well, how does um, how is this model used to select promising configurations? Well, that's precisely the Bayesian optimization approach. And in ParamLS, that would be the local search and GGA, the genetic algorithm, and so on. So Bayesian optimization, what is that in a nutshell? Um, it's visualized here. Um, if you just have a single parameter and you have here its performance, and in this case here, we're maximizing performance. So this dashed line is a true performance, but we don't know it. We only know it at some points where we've actually run our algorithm. And what you then do is you fit a probabilistic model to this data where 
this model should go through your data points or close to your data points, but far away from the data points, you're uncertain. And you have a mean function and um, predictive uncertainty, and you use this prediction in order to trade off exploration exploitation to look in regions where the predicted mean is relatively high, but the uncertainty is also high. So in this case, for example, here, where this is predicted to be pretty good, but um, could also be actually really good. You sample there and you see, oh, this was actually pretty bad. Then you update your model. So you see the model slightly changes here, mostly locally. And then you um, look again, okay, what's, what's predicted to be um, high in mean and has a high uncertainty. In this case, you would sample here and you iterate this process over time until basically you're out of time. So that's Bayesian optimization. And well, um, I've skimmed over the details here, of course, but the predictive performance model we use is actually based on random forests here, which um, we, we've shown in some um, work before, works really nicely for actually modeling um, high dimensions with low effective dimensionality. So often you have a lot of parameters, not all of which matter so much. And you also have a lot of instance features and um, you, you want to home in onto the, the important parameters and the important um, instance features and random forests are very good at that and they're also really stable and robust. So that's why we use um, them in Bayesian optimization. And then the next question is, well, you, we compare this list of configurations against the best configuration so far. How do we do that? Well, how many instances do we actually use in order to evaluate for each of these new configurations? Um, if you used a fixed number of instances, n, that would be suboptimal. And here's a plot um, back from ParmLS, where we have here um, ParmLS, so basic LS with an n equals to 100, 100 instances. That's really slow. With 10 instances, it, it makes progress much faster, maybe 10 times faster in the beginning, but then teeters off a little bit here, whereas with 100, it actually gets better. And with one, well, you actually really get, um, that's too noisy and you get overfitting and you can actually get worse over time. So a fixed number is not good. Um, rather, we do this adaptively, both in this focused ILS variant of ParmLS and in SMAC. Particularly, we start with n equal one, so just one instance, and then reject aggressively. And we increase only the number of instances for good configurations. And we can actually prove that this is not hurtful to reject aggressively, um, but that we can actually come back to configurations that were unlucky in their first evaluation and picked an instance for the one instance for which they're bad, for example. So we can prove that when using this aggressive racing, the probability that both ParmLS and SMAC find the true optimal parameter configuration approaches one. So that saves a lot of time over, for example, evaluating all instances. And we can save more time um, because poor configurations often take a very long time to solve a problem that the best configuration solves quickly, for example, an hour versus one second. And so we can actually cap this evaluation of the poor run after one second in this case, because we know it's not gonna beat the incumbent. So we, we can safely discard this. And um, in the case of ParmLS, that actually provably doesn't even change the trajectory. And both in the case of ParmLS and SMAG, this doesn't hurt our theorem when using aggressive racing and adaptive capping we still um, have that the true optimal parameter configuration is found. The probability of that approach is one. All right, so that is SMAC in a nutshell. We use Bayesian optimization with random forests to propose new configurations, and then we use aggressive racing and adaptive capping in order to compare them to the incumbent. And when they're better, then the incumbent changes, and the data that we've collected goes into the performance model and we iterate. All right, so um, before we go on, I just wanted to mention that really all of these components do matter for performance. So here is a case where um, I compare random search running on all the instances that are available, and that doesn't even make any progress over the default. In this case, well, that's for CPLEX, but um, similar stats would probably hold for planning. So there's no um, improvement at all. When you then include racing into the mix, then you actually do make some improvement, also with random search. When you then include 
also adaptive capping, then you make more progress, but still Bayesian optimization compared to this um, random search is still um, over 200 fold, um, a 200 fold speed up. And well, larger speed up if you didn't have racing or um, adaptive capping. All right, so what I'd like to do now is to actually um, yeah, um, come true to my promise of giving you these details on these four different applications of algorithm configuration and planning. The first one of that is for configuring um, fast downward. So this is done um, by Chris Fawcett and um, also together with, of course, uh, the Basel team. So, um, and um, yeah, Eris Capras is also on this and Holger Hose is uh, Chris's um, supervisor. So the um, parameter space that they chose back then was um, basically focus on really which heuristics do you um, do you choose and how do you set their parameters. And these heuristics were then combined in um, an alternating fashion in a, um, yeah, in a multi-heuristic um, greedy search. And um, there were also eight additional parameters for the search. So in total, there were 45 parameters, more than 10 to the 13 different configurations. And this was configured domain-wise back then with focused ILS. And the results were that, well, um, you got um, nice speedups over the default version, um, very few instances where this would yield slowdowns. And so in, on average, a tenfold um, speedup. And per domain, sometimes no speedup, where you already had a good default, and sometimes up to 23-fold speedups. Right. Um, the second application of algorithm configuration was actually um, at a similar time. Chris Fawcett was also involved in that, and uh, this was led by Mauro Valati. And the uh, parameter space that was picked here for LPG was um, an LPG is a local search approach that works on a linear action graph, um, basically looking for flaws in the plan and fixing them. So um, for example, there's of course parameters about the flaw selection strategy and then about the search neighborhood for the local search, the search strategy, pre-processing, heuristic functions, randomization, and, and so on. And so in total, that actually gave rise to 20, um, 62 parameters and more than 10 to the 17 configurations. Again, configured with focus ILS. Um, again, relatively similar results, tenfold speedups on average, and per domain, actually this helped for every single domain and sometimes also more than 100 fold speedups. And also, what this paper showed is that algorithm configuration can not only be used to optimize the um, speed of the planner, but also in the, in the coverage, but also to um, improve plan quality. So there's two domains here, and these are basically the plots with um, the configured um, version, and here's unconfigured version, and the configured version is much faster to achieve good plan quality, and in the end, it also has a much higher quality than the others do in the hand. All right, so next I want to talk about um, a work that um, I did actually together with Mauro. And here this, this is a little bit different. So this, this didn't just take one um, planner and, and configure that, but rather we looked at actually how to rewrite the PDDL file for any planner. So um, how can you actually write your domain model in a way that planners find easier to deal with, for example, because of tie-breaking? And there's not that many choices you have in, in writing the PDDL file, but, but you can order your domain predicates, you can order your operators, and within each operator, you can order the preconditions and the postconditions. And depending on the domain, that gives rise to um, a different number of parameters. Um, SMAC um, and ParamLS can't deal with order parameters, so we hacked this as a um, continuous parameter space. We basically said for each, um, for example, for each precondition of an operator, we gave it a continuous value, and then we just ordered these um, preconditions by this continuous value and um, coded up the parameter space like that. So that was up to 109 continuous parameters, and the results are well similar to before. On some domains or on some combinations of planner and domain, we didn't get any speed up, but it never got worse. 
Um, and on some, we actually got up to 300 um, fold speedups. For example, here, YASP on DPoS, there, there was just no instance that took longer than 10 seconds, whereas um, with a standard domain model, there were actually many timeouts at 900 seconds. And one really nice thing that Mauro also did here is to use this automatically found um, information to extract some knowledge about the domain model. So what he did is, is use this functional NOVA tool um, that we have for parameter importance. And that suggests to first list operators that are used often and that are, um, yeah. So we should first list these operators that are used often and that are used early um, in, in a typical plan. And we should also first list preconditions that are unlikely to be satisfied in order to avoid um, a lot of work being done to satisfy some the first preconditions, and then you get to the last one, and that is typically not satisfied. You can save that work and um, first work on the um, on the preconditions that are actually the hardest to satisfy. All right, um, and then Mauro didn't stop at that. He actually continued and also did this for the problem domain model. Um, so, for example, taking this original and um, configuring it to this one. Um, now, this is tricky. Of course, you, you can't just work on the problem domain model because, well, that would mean you actually need to solve that instance a bunch of times. Um, oh, so the, the problem model file. Um, but what you rather need is, is a domain-specific heuristic that applies for all problems in that domain. So um, what he did is to construct a parameterized heuristic that uses features of all the propositional facts in the planning and coding graph. And then he configured the parameters of that heuristic with SMAC and the, the 26 parameters, and he got speed ups up to um, 39 fold. And again, he used this um, analysis to figure out some general uh, recommendations. So um, what he recommended is that the ordering of the facts in the initial state and the goal states should be aligned, and recommended that you should first list propositional facts that often occur in preconditions and that often occur positively. And finally, also to first list propositional facts that are most connected in this planning and coding graph. All right, so that was a, a bunch of different applications of algorithm configuration. And I hope to have convinced you that this is actually really a robust tool that can be used in many different applications to optimize your planner performance. Now, I want to switch gears and actually go to algorithm, algorithm portfolios, which have a very different purpose. So algorithm portfolios are motivated by the fact that no single algorithm or parameter works best everywhere. They rather exploit the complementary strengths of these different parameter, of these different planners or parameter settings in order to do well everywhere. And um, there's different types of algorithm portfolios. There's algorithm schedules. Um, and these are actually very popular in planning. Uh, the first work on schedules um, dates back more than two decades to um, Adele House work back then. And um, also the fast downward stone soup planner is, has been very successful over the years and has showed um, over and over again that there is just no single planner uh, or no single approach that works best everywhere and that we need to get the best of all worlds in order to get general good performance in many different domains. Um, another type of algorithm portfolio is algorithm selection. And um, that actually hasn't been all that popular in planning. It's much more popular in, in SAT solving. Um, but there has been this, this one planner over the years uh, that's called IBACOP. And what that does is actually a per instance selection of some top algorithms. And they, they are actually still combined in a schedule. And um, so. There, there's some more recent work on algorithm selection, but I um, first want to talk about some features that you use in algorithm selection in order to actually make this possible. So um, if you have these features for planning tasks, then you can, of course, say, well, I've seen similar planning tasks before. And for those, this and this and this um, planner were good. Uh, or you can predict the runtime. So how can you characterize this fingerprint of a planning instance? Um, that was uh, the question we looked at back then um, in a paper with Chris Fawcett as first author. And we came up with 311 different features from different categories. So we used the PDL features by um, 
on previous features by Roberts et al. Then some features from the translation to a finite domain representation, um, some graph-based features from the causal and domain transition graph that were actually from Cinemore et al. from this EPACOP planner. Um, then some pre-processing and LPG, sampling and torchlight, some probing features and fast downward. And I've highlighted this because probing features is something that, that you can actually just really pretty much run in any domain that you tackle. You just run some algorithm for the type of problem at hand and see and, and extract some statistics from its short run. And, and that is actually a type of feature that works really well here in planning, but also in, in other types of applications. And likewise, uh, the success and timing features. You can always check whether your feature is computed or not and how long it took to compute these feature times. And you can use that as a feature itself. And so then there was also SAT um, representation types features. So overall, the, um, the takeaway from this work was that better, um, that more features typically lead it, um, led to better results. Um, in particular, if you used um, random forests, um, and these are the same types of random forests we use in SMAC because, well, they can actually select the most important features and in SMAC also parameters. And so here, if you put in some features that aren't actually that useful, it doesn't hurt performance. So um, you may as well put in um, a lot. So there are these features now. And um, with them, of course, you can do um, more algorithm selection. But um, actually, in the meantime, there is also deep learning approaches for algorithm selection, in particular um, in this Delphi planner by um, Katz et al. and later published at AAAI this year by Sievers et al. Um, what they actually did is to um, compute an abstract structure graph and then basically take a picture of that and use that with standard convolutional neural networks from um, deep learning that are known to work well with uh, images. And that actually worked um, very well. And well, they actually won the IPC um, with this. So um, yeah, it did work. Um, but then in follow-up work, actually, um, Ferber and uh, Ferber and Seib showed that simple machine learning techniques actually perform similarly um, when you use the same graph. Um, so when you take that graph and take statistics from it, such as, well, how many nodes are there, how many connections are there, and, and so on, then um, actually simple machine learning techniques suffice. So, so you don't actually need deep learning once you have that graph. But then again, if you do deep learning really well and you use graph convolutional neural networks that um, are nowadays the best types of deep learning techniques for graphs, then you actually do better again than the CNNs. All right, so um, so much for algorithm selection and planning. There's actually also a lot of work outside of planning on algorithm selection. In particular, already back in 2015, um, what we did is to collect a design space of a, a lot of different algorithm selection techniques, such as uh, multi-class classification, uh, pairwise cost-based classification, such as in Zadzilla, or hierarchical regression, which is in earlier versions of Sazilla, different types of nearest neighbor approaches and clustering approaches, and then all of the different hyperparameters. And we will use SMAC in order to find the best instantiation of each of these. And um, actually in this icon challenge on algorithm selection that had algorithm selection tasks from all kinds of different um, problem areas, um, this autofolio approach actually won the categories of the number of solved problems and uh, the penalized average runtime score. So um, this is a nice thing. If you don't know which type of algorithm selector to use for your data, um, this might be actually an easier um, approach. All right. Um, so we talked about algorithm configuration, and we talked about portfolios. And these two have really opposite strengths. So algorithm configuration is good at finding great configurations for homogeneous instance distributions, whereas portfolios are good at shining for heterogeneous distributions, for taking these inputs. So it doesn't give you new configurations, but it makes sure to use the right one for the right um, for the new instance at hand. And there's different ways that these two can be combined to get the best of both worlds. You can combine algorithm configuration and algorithm selection um, for example, in this approach, ISAC, which first clusters the instances and then uses algorithm configuration for each cluster. 
or in this Hydra approach that uses algorithm con configuration to search for the configuration that maximally improves an algorithm selector. Likewise, you can combine algorithm configuration and algorithm schedules. And for example, Cypedal, Cypedal um, used algorithm configuration for several planning domains and then combined the result into a schedule with uniform timeshares. And in a follow-up work um, that, that um, we did together with Yendrik, um, that was more similar to Hydra, but for schedules where we searched for a configuration and a time slot for that configuration to maximally improve the performance of um, a um, schedule. All right, so you can already get the best of both worlds of configuration and portfolios with these approaches here. But what you can't do is react to the state of the algorithm. So from what's going on, search progress, um, am I making any progress on this planning instance or not? It would be really nice to actually react to that and change our parameter settings dependent on that. And so that's what we want to do with dynamic algorithm configuration. So which planning parameters could we actually adapt? We've seen different case studies of using algorithm configuration. And in blue here, I highlighted the parameters that would actually make sense to adapt. So heuristics definitely makes sense to adapt over time. And I'll show an example of that. The search strategy definitely makes sense. And I'll also show an example of that. And local search parameters tend to always um, help if you change them over time. The one that doesn't really make sense to adapt over time is a problem encoding, domain model and problem model. Um, because while well, you do that once in the beginning, you could, however, think about restarting your algorithm and then using a different domain model or a different problem model in the restart. And then, well, when you restart and um, with which um, different models you restart, those would, of course, then be adaptive parameters. And uh, the other day, I also talked to Malte Helmert about this. Um, what are the planning parameters that you think um, could be adapted? And, and he said there, there's just really a lot. Um, but what this community might actually um, be excited about is to think about merge strategies for merge and shrink um, to adapt those and to actually configure them um, in the first place. And also in general, when to do something. So for example, when to derive a new heuristic or when to discard an old one. If that can be made um, conditional on certain um, state features, that could actually be really useful. All right, so there's lots of um, planning parameters to be ad adapted. And let, let's see how we do that. But before that, um, I do want to mention that we're definitely not the first ones um, thinking about uh, at reacting to state. There's actually this, uh, this really cool early pioneering work by Lagoudakis and Littmann that goes back almost 20 years, where they basically had a state-specific algorithm selection um, here for a sorting algorithm, and then for branching rules and DPLL for SAT. And um, they, they used really very similar techniques as, as we would use nowadays. And of course, the state of reinforcement learning wasn't quite as far. And actually, when I started my PhD, I, I consciously decided not to go down this road, but to rather stay with algorithm configuration and some algorithm selection, because those were much clearer defined problems. You didn't need reinforcement learning. It was just optimization, basically, for algorithm configuration and just supervised learning for algorithm selection. And reinforcement learning was, um, yeah. I, I found not well um, developed enough back then. And nowadays, there's been so much progress in reinforcement learning. I think now is really the right time to tackle this problem in its full generality with DUC. Um, again, we're not the only ones thinking about this also for planning. There's really cool work by uh, Pavel Gomoloc and colleagues. Last year at IACAPS, they had a, an approach to learn to switch between different search methods. And this year, they had um, a black box optimization of a neural network controller that would adaptively parameterize a mix between global and local best first searches. So there were six parameters that would be adapted over time and um, yeah, based on um, quite interesting state features. So uh, this is definitely uh, an example of, of what I would call DUC. So what is this DUC? Um, we talked about algorithm configuration formally. 
Now let's also formally introduce duck. And you see a very close resemblance between um, standard AC and dynamic AC. The two really differ in, well, there's this cost metric assessing the cost of a configuration here, and here it's a policy. And well, what is this policy? This policy, well, looks at the state and the instance and then spits out a configuration and that adaptively. So over time it changes and this policy can be evaluated just like a configuration can be evaluated doing rollouts. Um, you can formalize this duck problem as a contextual Markov decision process where basically while well, you have your little agent and it gets a state feature um, from your algorithm, um, applies some action. So in our case, it means set the parameters to a certain value. Then you run the algorithm for one step with these actions. Um, and then maybe you get a reward for that action and you get a new state. And you don't only do this in one instance, you can also do this on uh, multiple instances. And that's where um, the MDP becomes contextual. So um, contextual MDP is a set of MDPs, M sub i, where each m sub little i is an MDP that in this case here shares the same state space and shares the same action space, but has a different transition function and um, potentially a different reward function. All right, so that's a formal definition of duck. Um, next, let's look at um, some of its other properties. Uh, something that's really nice and that I've hinted on is that it strictly generalizes all the different formulations we've seen so far. So for example, algorithm configuration just gives you a static configuration. And you could of course mimic that with stack by simply not looking at your inputs and just always outputting a fixed configuration. Um, likewise, selection picks the right algorithm for a given instance. And again, you could just look at the instance and pick the right algorithm. And the space here of configurations is strictly um, uh, is a strict generalization of the set of algorithms because you can just have a single parameter that is categorical that has um, all these values, um, so all these different algorithms in there. And then, of course, you could do more cool things such as all the parameters of all these algorithms. So this is strictly more powerful. The same applies to schedules. There you look at the time. Here you could just look at the time and not the others, and so on. And this naturally gives rise to this proposition that the optimal duck policy is at least as good as the optimal solution to any of the above. And um, what's slightly more interesting is that actually the optimal duck policy can also be exponentially better than the optimal selector or the optimal schedule. And we'll see in a bit more detail what that can look like later. Um, before um, that, I want to first um, tell you why I, I have hope and um, that duck might actually also be a useful abstraction, just like I showed before that standard algorithm configuration is a useful abstraction. So we have three papers on DUC um, this year. The first one actually did a lot of experiments on white box and toy benchmarks to test the boundaries of DUC. The second one actually looked at um, controlling the continuous step size in CMAS, um, an evolutionary strategy. And then the third one is on AI planning. So what we did in the first one is to actually look at generalization across instances. And that can actually be really strong. Um, we looked at scaling with a number of parameters that was okay. Um, so up to five parameters can be, can be good. If, if there are strong correlations between them, then it gets um, somewhat harder. Um, and um, we had a task that really required using both instance features and state features. And there, Doug also did find um, the optimal solution. In this, in this um, problem here um, for up, um, looking at the continuous step size of CMAS, we had available already an existing heuristic um, for updating the step size in CMAS. And we showed that you can use guided policy search in order to actually learn from that teacher and then learn to be better than that teacher. And, and that would be a lot more sample efficient than without a teacher. And then this last work for AI planning, well, that I'm gonna tell you in a bit more detail now. So in this work, and that was just at the PRL workshop here at ICAPS, um, the setting is as follows. So the planner thinks about what, what state should I expand next? And it has access to different heuristics. And all of these heuristics say, um, 
a different state would be best. And the planner doesn't know who's correct, so he asks our RL agent, Mr. Duck. And that hopefully tells it the right state to expand. So much the comic version. So um, the basics here is we are in the setting of satisfying planning. We are searching for a good plan. And we know that inadmissible heuristics are actually difficult to combine. So if we just chose, chose the max of the different heuristics, then if we have one bad heuristic that says infinity, then everything is infinity and um, we're um, dead in the water. So rather, what we do is greedy search with multiple heuristics, um, where we have one separate open list for each heuristic. And at each step, each heuristic is evaluated. So the setting is not that we select which heuristic to evaluate, but it's what, what we select is which open list should we pick from. Um, so um, there was this paper by um, Gabi and Malte in 2010 that showed that actually this alternation strategy can be better than any single heuristic um, that is being combined. So um, not, yeah, not, not putting all your eggs in one basket, but alternating between these different heuristics and picking one open list um, at a time in a round robin fashion could actually be really good. And the question we ask ourselves here is, can we do better than alternation with a duck strategy? And theoretically, the answer is a resounding yes. So for each algorithm schedule, for each algorithm schedule, not, not only for this alternation strategy, but for any um, that just looks at time, and for each algorithm selector strategy too, there exists a family of planning instances, a collection of heuristics, and a dynamic control policy by duck. So that greedy best first search with a set of heuristics and this policy by duck expands exponentially less states than greedy best first search with the same set of heuristics and the schedule or the selection strategy. So that's cool. The question is, does this also empirically um, work out or is this only a theoretical result? And that's an empirical question. So. Um, we used reinforcement learning, of course, um, and here's the setup for that. So the action space in this experimental setup was we had four different heuristic functions to choose from. And the state space we used was we had a time step and we had really simple features um, in our state. So just really for each of the open lists of each considered heuristics, we only looked at the max, the min, the mean, the, standard, uh, the variance, and how many elements are at that open list. And we didn't actually use absolute values, but we used the difference between these features between consecutive time steps. The reward, we kept as simple as, as you can think, just minus one for each expansion step in order to find short plans. And the RL strategy was also quite simple. It's an epsilon greedy deep Q learning with a double DQN and with a relatively simple feed forward network with two hidden layers of 75 units each. And the experiment was um, when we did domain-wise training on six domains with 100 training and 100 test instances each. And um, lo and behold, we could actually show that our RL agent did better than the alternation strategy, did better than all the individual heuristics, or well, the alternation was much better than the individual heuristics, also better than the random. And we're also better than the best possible algorithm selector. So this is not just any algorithm selector, like one from the competition or so, but it's really the best you can do given that you can only choose between these four different heuristics. And um, so this alternation strategy is roughly as good and this RL approach is actually better than the Oracle. And then that's kind of cool. All right, so I'm nearing the end um, and I just wanna point out a few more things that we're doing in the realm of DAC and then some opportunities that I see for planning folks to actually um, join forces. So one thing that we, um, we looked at is that um, actions actually often need to be repeated many times in Duck. And so what we do is, is really we learn when to act. Um, and we, we have this tempo RL approach that basically uses hierarchical reinforcement learning to pick an action and then pick how long to repeat this action for. And that can substantially um, improve the, the sample efficiency of the approach. And then also at runtime, you don't need to query quite as often. Um, so it can also run faster. 
the next thing that we're um, currently looking at is an active selection of instances that are helpful in learning. Um, so using a self-paced reinforcement learning approach. Um, in in self-paced reinforcement learning, we actually have the value function, and we're making use of this value function for each instance to look at for which instance is a value function actually changing right now, where, where are we currently making progress, and we are I'm preferentially using those instances where we're making progress rather than any instances that we're solving all the time already really easily or instances that we can't solve at all yet. And then finally, we're currently creating a library of duck benchmarks um, using a simple um, format, the OpenAI gym format. And we would really love to include any duck problems that, that you can come up with or that you have. And that brings me to ways in which I think um, planning experts could be getting um, involved in duck. So the first one is really choosing the right problem. Where, where do you think duck would be most likely to actually help and which parameters are crucial to adapt? Uh, you know this, I, I don't. So uh, it'd be great to talk about that. Um, the second one is to constrain duck to simple strategies to actually aid interpretability and, and learn something about what's going on. And also what I think will be important sooner or later is to combine algorithm configuration and dynamic algorithm configuration. So configuring many static parameters, and then only some of them need to be dynamically adapted. The second um, way in which I see planning experts um, come in is in instance features. So we actually have these good instance features that I talked about, but, but we don't actually use them yet. And these might actually directly allow for domain independent planning by Duck. Um, probably this needs a bit more work, but um, I, I think this is definitely really exciting. In terms of state features, we, we really only had a very first shot at these. So better state features, I think, will, will definitely improve domain-specific and domain-independent planning. And um, this is something that also came from this um, discussion with Malte. What he said is really something that I'd like is something that looks at um, the whole log file of fast downward and then tells me what to do. because. Well, th this is something that, that Malte can do himself. He can look through this log file and, and figure out what's going wrong. And then he can have a good hinge on what um, heuristics should be used next and so on. And well, if Malte can do this, then it might be possible to actually, well, gather a lot of data and then train some um, interesting neural network. Um, for example, yeah, using transformers or so to parse this would be very cool. I, I think this is definitely um, not, um, to be solved next day, but um, I think this is a cool vision to have, and I think we will get there at some point. And the final set of opportunities I see for, for planning experts is to actually generate insights using these data-driven tools. So use algorithm configuration and DUCK to improve planner performance, but then use meta-algorithmic tools to understand why this performance improved, and use these gained insights to develop new and better algorithms. I think that would be really cool because in the end, we all care about making better algorithms and understanding things as scientists. For algorithm configuration, we actually do already have automated parameter importance analysis methods. Um, so something that uh, does forward selection to pick the right, um, the most important parameters and features, ablation analyses that tell you what are the most important parameters to change from the default value, functional ANOVA that quantifies how large the, um, the share of, of um, the variability in a function is by changing the different parameters and also quantifying the interaction effects between different parameters. And this is actually um, the tool that Mauro Vallati used in this domain configuration and the problem configuration, so kudos to him. And we also have a, a nice framework that actually generates automatically, um, automatically generates reports um, that make all of this algorithm configuration stuff a little bit less black box. For Duck, we, we don't have this yet, and it would be great to actually develop this. Um, maybe we can develop this together. And so one, one thing I, I think would be interesting there to look at is, can we have strong yet complex policies be approximated with simpler ones? And there I'd like to give another pointer to this work by Fairbairn Seib, who did something similar for algorithm selection. So I, I think if we could do something like that for Duck, and understand what are the policies that we're learning, that would be really cool. All right, with that, let me conclude. Um, algorithm configuration is a reliable workhorse that has often led to speedups of orders of magnitude. And then Duck 
That's a new kid on the block. Um, it's a strict generalization of algorithm configuration and selection and schedule, so, so it's really powerful, but it's also much harder. It's in this reinforcement learning setting, and we have first success stories, but it's still at an early state. And, and I would love if you could actually help us um, in making Duck a great thing for the community. So try Duck, break Duck, and improve Duck. And um, yeah, we're building a team of postdocs on Duck and Freiburg. So if um, you're excited by this, then, well, give me a call or an email. Uh, and if you have um, awesome graduating students, then, well, let them know too. With that, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to a lot of cool discussions. Thanks.